So to discuss antepartum fetal testing, we want to start with thinking what the purpose of testing a woman's fetus while she's pregnant is. So we can think if she is at risk for something that we clearly would want to be testing the well-being of the fetus. We also may want to just think about genetic screening, whether or not she is at risk for any of those things. So can be an identifiable risk or can just be a screening test that we're thinking of and going to discuss in this section. So what are the indications to do fetal procedures and in, in antepartum testing? So let's think about some medical conditions of a mother. I bet you guys can name the two big ones, right? Hypertension, um, whether it's pre-existing or comes up in pregnancy as preeclampsia. And the other big one would be our diabetic mother. Again, pre-existing diabetic or one who is a gestational diabetic. Um, let's also think about somebody who has genetic um, disorders or also somebody who has an infection. She, that would be somebody we're doing testing on their fetus. And then demographics, you want to think about your at-risk risk age groups and socioeconomic groups here. Obstetric factors, this one's really big. What if she's had a small for gestational age baby or a large for gestational age baby? Um, what if she has had um, a baby with a genetic um, disorder. So you want to think about those things. And then concurrent maternal factors. So you want to think about, is she obese? Does she use drugs? Does she smoke cigarettes? We clearly, in those circumstances, want to be looking at that um, baby a little bit more closely. So again, I refer you to the list of these things in chapter 10. And again, chapter 10 will um, really cover all of this content for you and fill in any gaps there may be. So we're going to frame this discussion and at the end of class, we will answer these two things. But I want you right now to jot down what you would do for Peg versus Michelle. Is it going to look different based on their presentations um, or will it look the same what we're going to offer? Will we offer more to one than the other based on the presentation? So really frame that for yourself because it will make this material make a lot more sense. So we're going to start, we're going to go through each of the trimesters and this recording will cover the first trimester testing. So in the first trimester, women typically have an ultrasound and then they have the option of having a nuchal translucency, which I'm going to refer to as an NT scan and a CVS, chorionic villa sampling. So let's start with the first question. Is an ultrasound necessary in the first trimester? It's almost always routinely done. And why it's routinely done is to measure the baby from crown to rump. We literally measure down here to confirm that the date of her LMP matches with the size of that baby for an estimated due date. So it's confirmation of a due date. So we're going to start again with that ultrasound and then I will go into those optional tests. So ultrasound is giving you an image of the baby and here it's showing you exactly as the ultrasound would the measurement of that crown to rump. Um, again, just another image of a fetus a little bit more um, formed and further along. And you can see again how they're measuring from crown to rump. You can see the spine that's forming on this baby as well very nicely down here. Down here. So, in the first trimester, how is this ultrasound done? Well, it's normally done vaginally, and that's because, right, if we're thinking about the first trimester, it's not until the end of this trimester that the uterus is even coming out above the um, symphysis pubis. So, we're going to do it vaginally. We want her to have an empty bladder because you can clearly see the bladder is going to be here, and if it's full, it's going to cause her some discomfort when the probe is placed. The probe is going to feel like pressure for her. It shouldn't be painful, but you want to inform her that it will feel like pressure. So we talked about um, using this ultrasound to date the pregnancy, so to give, um, to give a date. Also to confirm the pregnancy, um, to know that there is a positive pregnancy. Um, to check the viability of the pregnancy because even though she's pregnant and had a positive urine pregnancy test, um, until you do that ultrasound, you can't confirm that it's viable, that it's actually intrauterine, so that it's not an ectopic or anything else. 
So more than likely, once a woman is towards the end of her first trimester, um, and then definitely second and third trimesters, we'll do ultrasounds abdominally. And this is the reverse of the transvaginal one. Here you would like the woman to have a full bladder, especially if it's you know at that end of the first trimester and early on in the second, because a full bladder in this context will push the uterus up a little bit so that you can see that uterus and see everything transabdominally with an ultrasound. Um, gel just gets placed on the woman's belly and through sound waves you're able to visualize that fetus. So measurements that are taken once the baby gets further along. I talked about that crown rump length in the first trimester and then afterwards to ensure that the baby is growing proportionately we'll measure the length of the femur, the abdominal circumference, and the head circumference. Abdominal and head circumference should stand out to you. You're doing that on a newborn once it's born. We can detect if there's any size differences that are concerning in utero by using those same measurements that you're going to do on the newborn. Okay, so the two optional first trimester tests. There are two. The first, really importantly, the one that's called the NT scan, is a screening test. What everyone knows about screening tests, right? It is not diagnostic. It is simply a screening test. So this NT scan consists of an ultrasound that the mother has, and then she gets sent for blood work. So the baby has to be between 10 weeks and 13 weeks and six days um, in terms of its gestational age to have this test done. So what is measured is this thickness behind the back of the baby's neck. In this baby, it's enlarged, indicating that something could be genetically chromosomally wrong with this baby. However, it's only a screen, so we cannot tell for sure. So what it's highlighting here, it's showing you that in a normal fetus, which is on your left, you see the nuchal translucency area that's normal. And then here you see it enlarged, and this baby is then goes on to have diagnostic testing and it's confirmed to have trisomy 18. So again, this is showing you what you're seeing on that ultrasound for the nuchal translucency and TN. So what gets tested um, in the mom's blood is going to be HCG, which is clearly the hormone, human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, and that's the same thing that's going to indicate a positive pregnancy test. And then um, the PAP-A is the other portion of it, and what this is doing is it's testing to see if the fetus is affected with Down syndrome, so that's trisomy 21, trisomy 18, or trisomy 13. So again, the NT scan is a screening test combination of blood work and an ultrasound that gets done. So for the um, first trimester continuing on, we also have the chorionic villus sampling that can be done. This is a first trimester test. This test is a diagnostic test and it is invasive. This is a test that's done between 10 and 12 weeks of pregnancy and in this test, under ultrasound guidance, a needle is inserted through the vagina, through the cervix, and a portion of the developing um, chorion and that um, placenta is actually removed and tested for genetics. So, um, a high complication rate in terms of a miscarriage, and you can think of how that might happen by seeing this process as it's detailed. This is giving you background about what the chorion is. I encourage you to go ahead and read through this. So the risks of this diagnostic test, um, you may be thinking, well, I haven't really heard about this, but I've heard of an amniocentesis. Why wouldn't a woman just have an amniocentesis? So the chorionic villus sampling, which is done in the first trimester, can be done between 10 and 12 weeks. That's really early. You can find out for sure diagnostically if there is chromosomal abnormalities with the fetus. The amniocentesis isn't done until about 16 weeks at the earliest. So women may have to wait six weeks later and that might not be acceptable to some people. 
So with a chorionic villus sampling, there's about a 2% chance of a miscarriage um, because, again, we're taking that sample of the chorion and it could cause um, a miscarriage to occur. So this is detailing. Again, um, it can be done vaginally. It can also be done through the abdomen for the chorionic villus sampling. It just depends on the center and depends on the provider and what their comfort is in doing them. So I'll talk about a newer test that will not be on our exams or on NCLEX, but sort of where we're going with fetal testing. So if you guys want to Google Materni 21, and I will speak to it in class, we're now able to do simply blood work on a woman. And in, in that blood work of the woman, um, through taking circulating free cell DNA, which is fragments from the fetus that are found in the mom's blood, we can detect um, to a 99.1% rate um, the detection for Down syndrome in a fetus. So we'll talk about this one in class. So in the second trimester, just because you guys are going to look through this in review before class, I want you to now look at the quad screen and an amniocentesis. The rest we're going to cover in class. I'm going to give you a brief precursor so you can fill out your chart and we can start our class with talking about um, comparing and contrasting NT scan to a quad screen and a chorionic villa sampling or CVS to an amniocentesis. So in the second trimester, these two tests, the quad test is our screening test, quad screen, and our amniocentesis is our diagnostic test. So the quad makes sense, compare, con um, comprised of four things. We test mom's blood for AFP for human gonadotropin, human gonadotropin for estriol and inhibin A. Those four things all comprise the quad screen. Okay, and I will go through this in class, but go ahead and look through and see what, what it means if various levels of this are high or low. So I'm going to flip ahead and talk about this. The second trimester diagnostic test is an amniocentesis. So women who've had abnormal screening tests, so the NT scan or a quad screen, will be offered an amniocentesis. Women who are over 35 or have family histories of genetic disorders will be offered this, screen, this diagnostic test. How is the amnio done? Again, under ultrasound guidance and this time fluid, the amniotic fluid is what's being removed. You can see it here, the yellowish substance, and sent out to the lab for, um, for analysis. All right, and we will pick up with all this in class, guys.